Uh, our topic uh, today is, is democracy in crisis? Uh, I'll give you a simple bottom line, I think it is. <laughs> In 1975, a report was published by the Trilateral Commission titled The Crisis of Democracy. Its authors were the French sociologist Michel Croza, the American political scientist Samuel Huntington, and the Japanese political scientist Joji Watakanuki. It was an analysis of the increasing ungovernability of Western Europe, America, and Japan, and why it had occurred. Before we begin, I want to give some context to make sense of why intellectuals who had serious influence over states would believe that democracy would be in crisis to begin with. The last three decades since World War II ended had seen an unprecedented level of social change on almost every level. It was an unprecedented time of economic growth, with OECD countries averaging 4% growth per year. This was due to major technological changes like automation in factories and harvesters, which dramatically increased agricultural output. There was a significant expansion of higher education, which opened up to, to many more people. There was also major investment in infrastructure and military, to counter both Soviet military capacity and the ideological threat of communism. There were mass social movements concerned with class, the rights of minorities, environmental concerns, and imperialism. All of this change made it increasingly difficult for the states of developed countries to govern their population. In this episode, I will be primarily focusing on the American context. This is because the trends observed in all three reports are more or less the same, and I don't want to repeat myself, but also because America is far more important on the world stage, and because Huntington, as a person, played a far more significant role in world events after than the other two authors. He served as the White House Coordinator of Security Planning for the Presidency of Jimmy Carter and was responsible for the influential Clash of Civilizations thesis of how the post-Cold War world would play out, in which he posited that we would see conflict between various quote-unquote civilizational blocks going forward. While this theory is pretty stupid and was criticized both at the time and since, it has nevertheless had an influence in people in American foreign policy circles and has been cited over 30,000 times according to Google Scholar. Thankfully, Huntington's analysis of American post-war democracy, while not as influential, it's only been cited about 3,000 times, is far more interesting and accurate than his analysis of civilization. The crisis of democracy opens by discussing how in the 60s, America saw a dramatic renewal of the democratic spirit. There was a popular move from below that challenged established institutions of control. The 60s saw an increase in citizen participation in politics from almost every walk of life in nearly every way. Huntington cites an increase in the number of marches, demonstrations, and protest movements on behalf of environmental activists, minorities like blacks and women, increased agitation from clerical, technical, and professional workers, just to name a few. Many of these movements appealed to the government to fix problems in society, which resulted in the growth of the bureaucratic, regulating, and implementing institutions of the American government. Yet, at the same time, government authority in both perception and fact decreased. Huntington cites how both political parties and the presidency, two entities that he calls interest-aggregating import institutions, saw a decline in terms of engagement and public trust. Countervailing institutions like Congress and the media checked the presidency. The increased diversity of the public made coalitions and compromise harder. This tension between an increased demand for government intervention, alongside an increase in distrust in the government, and increased amounts of activism created an obvious paradox that threatened the capacity of the state to act. Moreover, it happened relatively quickly. For example, in 1960, less than 20% of the population thought that the United States was spending too much on defense. But by 1969, 52% of the population thought that too much was being spent on defense. The perception of government also declined relatively quickly. In the 50s, the majority of Americans thought that the government was run for the interests of the whole people only 17% saying that it favoured big interests. But by 1972, 53% of Americans thought that it favoured big interests. 
Alongside this was a decline in people's trust in the government to do or say the right thing, as well as a decrease in what Huntington called interest aggregating mechanisms like voting and political parties. Interestingly, this apathy towards interacting with the political system was strongly felt most by those who had direct experience. Their alienation towards formal institutions was the direct result of parties and government failing to deliver on what the people wanted. Huntington uses the fact that American society had become much more diverse and therefore had far more interest groups, which made compromise increasingly difficult and also led to increased polarization. Huntington gives the example of how consciousness among blacks led to increasing consciousness among whites in response, which made compromise difficult because the two groups had their interests so far apart. Nevertheless, compromise happened, which ended up alienating people on both sides. There were many consequences of this shift that Huntington was concerned with, many of which we are still grappling with to this day. But an immediate concern for Huntington was the impact of this crisis on foreign policy. He notes that because democratic countries are more beholden to interest groups and have incentives for immediate achievements over long-term strategy, more dictatorial countries have a supposed edge in this regard. Likewise, he's concerned that a population used to the substantial domestic programs will resist the sacrifices that the government will have to impose on them to deal with certain foreign policy or defense concerns. Finally, there are soft power concerns. Huntington is worried that if Americans no longer trust their government, then people around the world will no longer trust America. In terms of solutions to the problem, Huntington calls for moderation in democracy. He notes that prior forms of democracy relied on apathy or exclusion by minority groups, and that for American democracy to function into the future, it would need exclusion, apathy, or restraint by some minority groups. He also notes that America had seen prior periods of popular egalitarianism, namely the pre-Civil War Jacksonian era and the Progressive era that faded, and that he expects the current phase to fade. Looking back on this moment from nearly five decades away, we can see that Huntington was right about the democratic surge being temporary. Some of this was due to the fact that progressive movements succeeded, such as the Civil Rights Act, or burnt out, such as the SES leading to the water underground, which failed to seriously impact US imperialism, but it was also repressed by top-down approaches such as COINTELPRO or bottom-up approaches like the assassination of MLK. Moreover, the crisis of democracy was never really solved. Trust in the United States government never recovered from the Nixon administration. A Pew Research overview of polls of public trust in government showed that while there was some confidence gained under the Reagan and Bush administrations, the only time the majority of Americans trusted the government, always or most of the time, was October 2001. We've also seen a general decline in voter turnout and civic participation since then. What's interesting to me is how all of this coincides with the so-called neoliberal turn. People on the left have documented how the ideas of neoliberal thinkers spread and how there was a reaction to the social democratic gains of the post-war era by elites. Many make connections between the rate of profit and the collapse of social democracy. But what largely goes ignored by leftists is the problem of complexity. A big part of this, I think, is that leftists don't want to give ground to their opponents. For example, Noam Chomsky likes to use this report as an example of elite fear of the masses asserting their rights. Well, this is the correct read, but this doesn't mean that the concerns about the governability of society and the limitations of centralized democratic systems are not real. The crisis of democracy might be a document that advocates for the interests of the ruling class, but this doesn't mean that the concerns it raises aren't real. Indeed, there's a good argument to me that the tepid centrism that many on the left decry is a direct result of the increasing diversification of interests that we see in society. This makes it more difficult to enact the sort of sweeping reforms that many leftists desire. Likewise, it also explains why capitalism more and more relies on rent-seeking for profitability. Society is now more complex, yet we still rely on centralized institutions. This means that the only people who can get things done are those who have the time and resources to successfully navigate the institutions that control the centralized system. 
This analysis is in line with my prior episode on Yunir Bayam's paper on complex adaptive systems and society. This is why organizations like political parties can operate like industrial era organizations in terms of who gets to make the decisions. Voters don't actually have to be informed about anything, they just have to be willed out to vote. That the left fails to recognize these dynamics is reason for both concern and hope. On one hand, failing democracies have a tendency to solve the problem by defaulting to authoritarian solutions that restore order by suppressing complexity. This is indeed a terrifying possibility. But on the other hand, it means that leftists have been fighting with at least one hand tied behind their back. A fleshed out theory of the problems of collective action and delineating and compromising between conflicting desires effectively would be explosive, to say the least. Moreover, there's good reason to think that overcoming liberal democracy would overcome much of capitalism, since, after all, it relies increasingly on rent-seeking mechanisms to maintain profitability. A post-liberal society that is more complex and adaptive will be one in which it's harder to enact and maintain the rent-seeking mechanisms which rely on institutional rigidity and obscurity to survive. At the same time, we should be wary of overly deterministic models. Another paper published by Yenea Bayam called Complexity and the Limits of Revolution on the then ongoing Arrow of Spring talks about the difficulty of building governance structures. It argues that one of the reasons that sudden violent revolution tends to statistically fail is that complex governance structures take time to construct because, well, they're so complex. The reason that authoritarianism emerges so often is that in terms of structure, it is relatively simple with only a few moving parts, as such you can easily default to it. Liberalism, on the other hand, with its checks and balances, is more complicated, and thus is more difficult to set up. We should assume, therefore, that any social order that is more complex than liberalism will be even harder to create. However, one positive going forward over prior attempts to surpass liberalism is that information technology can dramatically lower the cost of building social coordinating technologies such that small groups can experiment with alternatives and share information or best practices with each other. This means that we can iterate and experiment much faster than before. This, in my opinion, is the best hope that we have going forward. Liberal democracy and authoritarian regression are both unable to cope with the complex demands of the contemporary world. Only social technologies that are sufficiently complex will be able to thrive going forward. This means that they will be of enormous consequence even if they are only adopted by a small minority. Is democracy in crisis? Uh, I'll give you a simple bottom line, and I think it is.